Hi students and welcome to another e-lesson video. This one over rhetorical schemes part one. The first set of schemes that we're going to look at in AP Lang this year. As with all of these videos, please feel free to pause and rewind at any time to take notes, rewatch, or get caught up. Let's see what we're doing in this video. We're going to start with just a refresher over what schemes are. Then we're going to look at two different types of schemes today. Schemes of repetition and then schemes of omission. First of all, what are schemes? If you think back to about a month ago when we first started studying stylistic devices, we kind of divided stylistic devices in half. Uh, really, there's more divisions than that, but our study is divided in half. Uh, we divided it into uh, devices that deal with word choice, uh, things like metaphor and simile and personification, and uh, devices like uh, paradox and irony. Those all essentially deal with word and idea choice. Uh, and the other side are devices dealing with syntax uh, syntactic choices, word arrangement, that sort of thing. So schemes are devices that are built around word order and word arrangement. Based on how we create our sentences, clauses, and phrases, we can uh, craft certain devices that help us state things a certain way based on, based syntactically. Schemes are syntactic devices. Many scholars consider schemes uh, types of figures of speech, uh, and that may make sense. If, if the definition of a figure of speech is simply saying something differently than the ordinary way of saying it, then yeah, uh, schemes are figures of speech. Uh, but do keep in mind that they differ from tropes that we've studied this year, which are devices dealing with word choice. Uh, let's look at schemes rep of repetition first. Uh, schemes of repetition are those uh, schemes in which words or phrases are repeated within sentences or over consecutive sentences. And what this does is it allows the author to add emphasis to those repeated terms. They're just naturally emphasized because the reader sees them over and over and over again. Schemes of repetition may also give the give greater clarity to what an author is trying to say or provide what an author is trying to say a sort of pleasing rhythm. It might just sound cool when read out loud, which when we're reading silently, um, we should we kind of hear what we're saying on, on the page as well. So that's where that pleasing rhythm comes from. Um, let's take a look at some specific devices. The schemes of repetition I want to go over today start with anaphora. And this is a device a lot of you are probably already familiar with. That's where I wanted to start with something that was easy that you guys already knew. Anaphora. This is the repetition of the same word or phrase at the beginning of successive phrases, clauses, or sentences. Something like this. It rained on his lousy tombstone, and it rained on the grass on his stomach. It rained all over the place. Here you can pretty easily see why this is an anaphora. We've got the repeated uh, subject verb pair, it rained, it rained, it rained, um, repeated over and over again at, this, at the beginning of successive clauses uh, and sentences here. So that's what makes this anaphora. Here's another famous example here from Winston Churchill. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. It's a very powerful statement there, and the power comes from the emphasis that's placed on the repeated uh, anaphora here. We shall fight, we shall fight, we shall fight. Um, this would have sounded far weaker had ha um, had a. Uh, excuse me, had Winston Churchill not employed anaphora and said, we shall go on to the end, we shall fight in France on the seas and oceans with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. That's not nearly as impactful as reminding the reader that we shall fight, because this was a, de a declaration of resolve, of Britain's resolve to fight even in the face of this overwhelming adversity that they were presented with back in 1940s during the Blitz. So that is anaphora, repeating the same word or phrase at the beginning of successive phrases, clauses, or sentences. Let's take a look at the next one. Epistrophe. Epistrophe is also known as antistrophe. It's the same term. It just has two different names. I'm going to refer to it in this class as epistrophe. Epistrophe is the repetition of the same word or phrase at the end of successive phrases or clauses. Uh, phrases, clauses, or sentences, rather. Not quite as common as, an, as anaphora, but it is still heard. Here's an example from Robert Penn Warren's Flood, A Romance of Our Time. The big sycamore by the creek was gone. The willow tangle was gone. The little enclave of untrodden bluegrass was gone. The clump of dogwood on the little rise across the creek, now that too 
was gone. So each of these sentences ends with the same um, verb phrase, was gone, was gone, was gone, was gone. And by repeating that over and over again, we're left with that sense of loss that this particular speaker has. Uh, and it's just because it's repeated over and over again. Here's another example from ooh, a book we're about to start reading, uh, from The Grapes of Wrath. This is a, from a, a sort of little monologue that Tom Joad delivers toward the end of the novel. Then I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. And when our folk eat the stuff they raise and live in the houses they build, why, I'll be there. Here, the epistrophe, that sort of repetition of the of the independent clause, I will be there, uh, it, it makes it gives it kind of ominous, uh, a sort of ominousness uh, to it. Um, so yeah, it's it, you you can definitely hear the uh, hear the sort of threatening tone behind Tom Joad's words there because he repeats the the he gives us this constant repetitive reminder that he will be there whenever these injustices are, are going wrong, presumably are being performed, presumably to punish those who are doing them. So that is a Epistrophe, the repetition of uh, word or phrases at the end of successive phrases or clauses, uh, successive phrases, clauses, or sentences. Let's take a look at another one, Simplosi. Simplosi is a sort of combination of anaphora and epistrophe. It's the repetition of one word or phrase at the beginning and of another at the end of successive clauses, sentences, or f phrases, verses, whatever. It's, a, again, a combination of anaphora and epistrophe. Um, so like here from uh, G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy, the madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. So it's a combination of rep a repetition of um, the same words and phrases at the beginning of successive lines, uh, successive sentences here, and at the end. Uh, the madman is, the madman is, his reason, his reason. Here's another one. Oops, come on. There we go. This is from, oh, Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. Most strange, but yet mostly, uh, most truly I will speak. That Angelo's forsworn, is it not strange? That Angelo's a murderer, is it not strange? That Angelo is an adulterous thief, an hypocrite, a virgin violator, is it not strange and strange? Here again we have the repetition of a couple of phrases um, at the beginning of each of these uh, series of lines, this, this is uh, verse, as well as at the end, is it not strange, is it not strange, is it not strange? So that is Simplosi, pretty simple concept if you understand anaphora and epistrophe, it's just a combination of the two. Now let's take a look at some schemes of omission. Schemes of, of omission are a little bit more difficult because a lot of you haven't really studied them before. But let's dive right in. And we're, uh, first of all, schemes of omissions uh, are, simply occur when you omit words which are easily understood uh, from phrases. When you take words out of phrases which could be easily supplied uh, just by our brains. In fact, we often don't even notice these as schemes because our brains just sort of fill in the gaps that are left out. Um, what schemes of omission allow us to do is it allows for greater concision, it helps us avoid repetition, it creates a quicker flow of writing. Um, certain schemes of omission can also be used to create witticisms, very witty and clever uh, uh, remarks, and we'll see a bit of that here in a minute. So our first scheme of repetition we're going to look at, let's start with ellipsis. Ellipsis is the first scheme of repetition. This is one of the big ones. Uh, ellipsis is simply when you omit a word which is easily understood in your sentence. That's it. So something like this. The average person thinks he isn't. The average person thinks he isn't. Logically speaking, this makes perfect sense, but it's because we're supplying the missing word. There's a missing word there at the end, average. The average person thinks he isn't average. This is uh, ellipsis, what we call ellipsis. Uh, here's another one. And so he went on, and the people groaning and crying and saying amen. Oops, this is from Huckleberry Finn. I forgot to cite this. So he went on, and the people groaning and crying and saying amen. Again, we process exactly what's going on here, but there's a, a key grammatical word missing from this. We're missing a verb that our brains are just kind of supplying. And so he went on, and the people were groaning and crying and saying amen. So both of these are examples of using ellipsis, which is simply just omitting a word that our brains typically naturally supply uh, from the sentence, but they're, they're words that are grammatically kind of understood in the sentence. 
Let's take a look at a closely related device called Zugma. That's how this is pronounced. Zugma. Z-E-U-G-M-A. Zugma. Um, Zugma is closely related to ellipsis because it actually uses ellipsis. It is another device that, that uses a form of ellipsis. You could kind of, in a way, say that it's a type of ellipsis, sort of. Um, it's where you use ellipsis to create a sentence where a single word governs two or more other parallel parts of the sentence without repeating that word. That sounds really complicated, but I promise you, you've used Zugma before. Here we go. Her beauty pierced mine eye, her speech mine woeful heart, her presence all the powers of my discourse. This is an example of Zugma because we have an omitted word, it's the, remember it's the use of ellipsis, where we've omitted a word and that single word, or we're using a word that to govern two or more other parallel parts of the sentence. In this sentence it's the word pierced. Here we go. Her beauty pierced mine eye, her speech pierced mine woeful heart, her presence pierced all the powers of my discourse. But we leave out, we actually use ellipsis to leave out the second, the second and third pierced here. Uh, and so that's what makes this zugma. Here's another example from Francis Bacon. Histories make men wise, poets witty, the mathematics subtle, natural philosophy deep, moral grave, logic and rhetoric able to contend. Now this sentence is filled with all kinds of words that are left out, but it's because it's the same word that's left out over and over again. It's this verb, uh, the, um, the verb phrase, make men, or makes men. Here's what it would sound like if I filled it in. Histories make men wise, poets make men witty, the mathematics make men subtle, natural philosophy makes men deep, moral, whatever that is, I don't know if he meant morality or studying morals, ethics maybe, more, this is from, you know, for over, yeah, it's from 1601, so good night. That's a long time ago. Not sure what he meant. Moral makes men grave. Logic and rhetoric make men able to contend. So this is Zugma because, again, we're using ellipsis. We're leaving out words that our brain can actually fill in. Uh, but it's Zugma. It's specifically Zugma because we're using a single word to govern multiple parts of the same sentence. So we're using here the verb pierced to, to govern a whole bunch of different nouns that are being pierced. Here we're using a whole, uh, the same uh, verb phrase, make men, uh, with a verb and a uh, uh, direct object here, um, we're, we're using that over and over again to kind of connect a noun and an adjective. Poets to witty, the mathematics to subtle, and so that is what zugma is. To some it's helpful to think of zugma as a sort of combination of ellipsis and parallelism. Yeah, that's sort of correct. You're using ellipsis in parallel construction, that kind of makes sense. Uh, where that, that central verb, sometimes it's a central noun, but usually it's central verb, governs a bunch of different nouns or different adjectives, whatever, however it's being used in the sentence. Lastly, I want to take a look at a special type of zugma called solepsis. So we've taken a look at ellipsis, and zugma actually is a, is a sort of form of ellipsis. Now we're taking a look at a special form of, solep uh, of zugma called solepsis. Solepsis, as I said, is a special type of zugma where that central word, the word that is used once but omitted throughout the rest of the sentence, that central word governs multiple parallel parts but in doing so, it carries different denotative, connotative, or figurative meaning. Uh, it's a particularly witty form of zugma, whereas zugma is really just kind of a, um, a syntactic construction that we all use. Anytime that you've created a sentence with a compound direct object, but one central verb, you're using zugma, um, as long as the objects are grammatically correct and parallel. Um, Solepsis is a sort of witty form of zugma. It's a real stylistic device um, because that, that word is kind of used, used cleverly because it's applied in different ways. Here's what I mean. This is from Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. I believe this is referring to um, Tim O'Brien's tour in Vietnam, so the guy that would lead the patrol carrying the strobe light. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. It's zugma because we have a central verb, uh, carried, governing multiple parallel parts of the sentence. He carried a strobe light, carried the responsibility of their lives, but carried isn't repeated. It's just mentioned one time, so it's omitted here. Ellipsis is here. What makes this solepsis is that the uh, meaning of carried differs from place to place. He carried a strobe light literally in his hands, and he carried the responsibility for the lives of his men figuratively in the, in the responsibilities of his duty. Okay? Um, so here we have it used literally, and here we have it used figuratively.
So that's a good way, or a, a, a common way of using solepsis. Here's another example. We were partners, not soulmates, uh, two separate people who happened to be sharing a menu and a life. It's kind of a cool sentence from Amy Tan there. And again, we have Zugma. We were partners, not soulmates, two people who happened to be sharing a menu and sharing a life. We have this central infinitive here, to be sharing, um, that's governing both a menu and sharing a life. But it's using sharing in two totally different uh, meanings. Um, they're both they're sharing a menu, literally looking at it together, and they're also sort of figuratively sharing their life experience.